Greetings, my name is Dr. Magoha, and today we'll be discussing blunt cerebrovascular injury. Blunt cerebrovascular injury involving the carotid or vertebral vessels is a potentially devastating and commonly underdiagnosed injury. Trauma to the carotid is more common than to the vertebral artery. It is responsible for 1% of all blunt trauma admissions and 7% of trauma admissions with an injury severity score of 16 or more. It is a potentially devastating if left untreated disease with a mortality of about 23 to 28% and severe neurologic morbidity of about 48-58% to 58% if untreated. Screening and treatment reduces stroke incidence and morbidity and mortality. Bilateral injuries occur in 18-25% to 25% of people, with road traffic accidents being the most common overall cause. In patients above 65 years of age, ground level falls are the most common etiology. Now on to the mechanism of injury. There's type 1, which is direct cervical trauma. This could be caused by things such as near hanging, a seat belt, or strangulation. It's responsible for about 10% of blunt carotid injuries. Type 2 is cervical hyperextension and hyperflexion with rotation. This is the most common mechanism. Type 3 is intraoral trauma or direct injury to the internal carotid artery at the angle of the jaw. Type 4 is laceration of the internal carotid artery from a basilar skull fracture. Now onto the pathophysiology. Trauma results in an intimal tear exposing the subendothelial collagen causing platelet aggregation and thrombus formation. This blunt force trauma may also result in venous occlusion or embolism, subintimal dissection, luminal narrowing and vessel occlusion if acute, partial or complete transection, a pseudoaneurysm with an embolus nidus, which may rupture both extra or intracranially, or cause an arteriovenous fistula, which may also rupture and hemorrhage. The injury is graded using the BIF, blunt, carotid, and vertebral artery injury grading system. Now on to the clinical presentation. Majority of patients are asymptomatic with only 25 to 50% developing their first symptoms more than 12 hours after the injury. These include arterial hemorrhage from neck, the nose, or the mouth, an expanding cervical hematoma, a carotid bruit in a patient with a focal neurologic deficit, or a transient ischemic attack, which is inconsistent with the head CT scan. Most strokes occur 12 to 72 hours after the injury, with a median of about 48 hours. A few patients present with Horner's syndrome due to periarterial sympathetic plexus injury. What are the risk factors for injury? A note, these patients require urgent diagnosis and treatment. For this, we use an institutional screening criterion based on the Denver criteria. This includes patients with Lefort fractures, type 1 and type 3, uh, cervical spine fractures, mostly C1 to C3, and subluxation which involves the transverse foramen injuring the vertebral artery, basilar skull fractures involving the carotid canal or the petrous bone, any patient with diffuse axonal injury with a glass coma scale of less than 6. Any near hanging patient with anoxic brain injury. And any patient who presents with any clothesline type of injury 
or seatbelt injury, especially those with pain, swelling, and any mental status change. What are the reported associated injuries? From multiple series, these are the associated injuries. Number one, the head or the brain at about 50%, the face at about 34% regarding mandibular and Lefort fractures, the spine at about 40%, chest and abdominal injuries are also at about 40%. How do we diagnose BCVI? We use the following screening modalities. Number one, Cerebral Digital Subtraction and Geography, or DSA for short. This is the gold standard. However, it's, it is invasive with a 1-2% to 2% reported stroke, catheter insertion, or contrast complications. Number two is CT angiography. This is the preferred screening test for BCVI. A 16-slice CTA will have a high sensitivity of about 97 to 98% and a specificity of 99 to 100%, with a positive predictive value of 100% and a negative predictive value of 99.3%. Number three is magnetic resonance and geography. This has less bone artifacts and avoids contrast agents. It can also detect infacts earlier but has a poor sensitivity of between 50 to 75% and a poor specificity of only 67%. Number four, duplex ultrasonography. Use of this is not supported by evidence as an appropriate screening modality due to poor sensitivity. The examination is only limited to the cervical vasculature and grade one to three injuries are easily missed. Now, treatment. Due to the nature of the illness, there are currently no controlled clinical trials on treatment. However, these are the following recommendations. Number one, antithrombotic therapy. This is the first line treatment for most BCVI injuries, apart from grade five injuries. It reduces the rate of neurologic morbidity and mortality. Number two, antiplatelet agents like aspirin and clopidogrel. These are the initial agents if there are no plans for invasive procedures or a need for reversal. There is no evidence for the superiority of clopidogrel over aspirin as no evidence that dual antiplatelet therapy is superior to monotherapy. Unfractionated heparin. This is the initial agent if reversal is needed. There is no bolus given, and you have a conservative APTT target of about 50. Surgical repair. This is rare and is limited to only surgically accessible lesions refractory to medical therapy. endovascular therapy. This requires concomitant antithrombotic therapy to prevent reocclusion. It's most useful in progressive flow-limiting luminal narrowing injuries, acute large vessel occlusion without completed stroke, and insufficient collateral circulation. In pseudoaneurysms, in preventing embolization or progression and in grade 5 injuries that need parent artery embolization. How do we follow up these patients? We repeat a CTA or DSA at 1 to 6 weeks post-injury or if there is any neurologic change in the patient. Complete healing occurs in about 57% of grade 1 and 8% of grade 2 lesions. When this happens, you can stop treatment. About 8% of grade 1 and 43% of grade 2 lesions progress to pseudoaneurysms. 
For these, consider endovascular treatment. More than 50% of grade 3 lesions remain stable, with a few enlarging at 6 months. Grade 4 injuries rarely improve. Repeat imaging at 3 monthly intervals if the lesion has not yet healed. The Western Trauma Association guidelines has a very useful algorithm for the diagnosis and management of BCVI. Thank you for your attention and have a blessed day.